Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a special episode focusing on three important row crops. First up, the soybean. And we take a deep dive into corn to find out what makes this crop so special. In Southern Gardening, a double header, we look at pretty pink landscape plants and ornamental grasses. And in our final report, we show you what makes wheat so wonderful. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. Welcome to this special edition of Farm Week focusing on three row crop commodities and what makes them so special. In our first special report, we look at soybeans, one of the most farmed crops in the U.S. and worldwide. But why are they so important? What are soybeans used for? You probably use soy-based products every day without even knowing it. They're a very multi-use crop and that makes them profitable. So we take a deeper look into what makes this plant one of the biggest row crops in the world. <music> The humble soybean, number one row crop and the number two ag commodity in Mississippi with over 111 million bushels produced in 2020. So what exactly makes this plant so special? What exactly is a soybean? So soybean plants are legumes, uh, they'd be related to something like a pea. Uh, legume just means that these, these plants are able to fix nitrogen uh, from the atmosphere and use it in a form that the, the plant can use in the soil. Soybeans have several growth stages that experts normally refer to. The vegetative stages, VE through V4, are essentially the plant's youth. The reproductive stages, R1 through R8, take the plant from flowering to growing pods to harvest. Soybeans have a high protein count, which makes them an excellent food source, both for us and for animals. The main use of soybean today is, is likely livestock and poultry. Uh, feed. Soybeans have a high protein content. When they're processed, it's either done in the form of meal or the oil. And most of the meal is used for, for animal food. Uh, oils can be used in human food. Uh, there's lots of things that, that we eat every day that we might not even realize that soy is a, is a part of. Other aspects, I'm sure people have heard of biodiesel. That's one use that soybeans contribute to. And there's even uh, things like lubricants and, and things like that in the industrial sector that soybeans can be used for. It wasn't always like this, though. The soybeans seen a huge boost in uses over the past 30 years. Used to be, they were only grown on soils where other crops couldn't. When you look at the history in our state, you know, we primarily were a cotton producing state uh, historically. And soybeans have, have been, even in those days, were grown across a lot of acres. They were grown primarily on the acres that probably weren't suitable to produce cotton on. They were, they were grown, you know, as a rotational crop in some cases. So, why have they become so popular? In short, their adaptability. They're a fairly hardy plant that finds a way to thrive in almost all soil types, at least in Mississippi. They can grow in hard clay soil, sandy soil, and everything in between. So over the years, soybeans have come a long way. Uh, modern varieties have been adapted to grow in a, in a wide range of latitudes and environments, meaning that, that there, there are varieties suitable for extreme northern latitudes with short growing seasons and uh, further you know, south or southern latitudes where we can have longer growing seasons and, and different daylight uh, times and things of that nature. So soybeans are grown all over the, the world, really, but they're, they're widely adapted across the U.S. But that didn't happen overnight. Along with innovative new ways to use soybeans, a lot of research has gone into finding better ways to grow and care for the crop. More recently, I guess, over the last 15, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we've changed the way we, we produce soybeans. We have different management practices that, that have been adopted. Uh, anybody that's, that's in, the, in the production world has heard of the early soybean production system that was uh, developed you know, years ago. That really revolutionized what we're able to do uh, with soybeans. We've increased our yield potential through scouting efforts, uh, technology, uh, you know, modern genetics have come a long way. So just all the way around the board, we're able to produce more per acre. So 
what are the major issues with growing soybeans? No plan is perfect. Well, most of them have to do with the same issues as other row crops, mainly weeds, bug pests, and disease. Some of the major issues, or really all of them, are, are very similar to what other uh, commodities would experience. So weed control is a, is a major concern. You know, in soybean in particular, disease management is a big deal. And, uh, insect pressure can, can be detrimental to, to our yield. Uh, you know, those are probably three of the, of the biggest factors that have variability in them. But the one thing that keeps this crop strong is the same reason it became popular in the first place. It's hardiness and adaptability. Soybeans are, they're a very forgiving plant uh, if, they, if they're given what they need and, and they're taken care of. So, for example, if you have subpar populations after planting due to weather or too much rain, flooding kind of scenarios, you know, they can compensate and, and certain varieties can bush out and, and compensate for a lack of uh, plant population, uh, uh, so to speak. So, you know, the genetic parents of these varieties that we grow, some are more upright in their, in their architecture, some are shorter and bushier, so they'd be more suited to fill out a wider row. All of these factors combine to create a commodity that's one of the pillars of the ag market and the top row crop in Mississippi, for now. Prices change, and with that also comes decisions for producers. In a state like Mississippi, where we have our big three of being soybean and, and cotton and corn, um, they all kind of fit well together, and really it's just going to be dependent on what the market price is that year as to, as to what the big money-driving selection is going to be. So, that's the soybean, a plant with many uses and potentially more to come. It's grown all over the world, and although market prices fluctuate regularly, it seems that this commodity will stay relevant for many years to come. This week in Southern Gardening, we have a double header. Our first one is about bringing pink to your landscape. Pink flowers certainly stand out with eye-catching color, simple beauty. Here's Eddie with some varieties that can make your garden prettier in pink. Plants with the color pink on them are eye-catching in the landscape. Here are some of my favorites. Super Tunia Vista Bubblegum was selected as a Mississippi Medallion plant in 2012. It's no wonder, with its beautiful bright pink flowers that cover the dense green foliage, the complementary dark pink lines on the flower petals lead to the dark pink eye in the center. Its mounding growth habit can reach up to two feet tall. In this mass-planted landscape planter on the front of this home, it creates a pink ground cover. And I love the way these plants sprawl out all over the edges of the planter like a cascading waterfall. These caladium leaves with dark pink veins and splotches of light pink with green edges really stand out in part sun and shade. The backdrop of the Truffula Pink Gomfrina has a perfectly balanced habit that shows off the plethora of hot pink flowers. It performs well in our hot and humid climates where it blooms all season long. Cleome, also known as spider flower, is another plant that has pink flowers. Its name comes from the appearance of the long, thread-like pink stamens of the individual flowers and the elongated seed pods that develop below the blooming flowers. Let's not forget purple heart plant. Its purple foliage creates the perfect backdrop for its small pink flowers to shine. As you can see, Plants with pink on them can make a beautiful addition to your landscape. I'm Eddie Smith and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. In our second Southern Gardening segment, there are a ton of ornamental grasses out there. And whether they're just a few inches tall or over your head, they all look amazing in your landscape. Here's Eddie Smith with a look at three ornamentals that just might catch your eye.
Today, Southern Gardening is at the North Mississippi Research and Extension Center, Magnolia Botanical Gardens, looking at some impressive ornamental grasses. Ornamental grasses are great landscape choices and can add color and interesting texture to any garden. Zebra grass, a clump forming grass, is noted for its horizontally banded foliage. It also has long, linear leaves that grow up to eight feet tall. The leaf blades are green with irregularly spaced yellow zebra-like horizontal bands, which appear at irregular intervals. Zebra grass does well in our long, hot growing season here in the South. One of my all-time favorites is Gulf Muley grass. Gulf Muley grass is a native plant that's showy in the fall and winter months. In the fall, it produces billowy masses called inflorescence, which resemble pink clouds in the landscape. Select a landscape site for muley grass that receives at least six hours of full sun during the day. Also, spacing needs to be considered, as these plants can grow up to three feet wide and three feet tall. Another eye-catching grass, strawberries and cream ribbon grass, has long green and white striped blades that cast a delicate rosy hue. Offering three seasons of color, this ornamental grass adds garden interest when nearby bloomers are taking a break. Strawberries and cream ribbon grass is neither too picky about sun nor soil conditions, making it a great choice for those hard to plant places. As you can see, ornamental grasses can make a beautiful addition to your landscape. I'm Eddie Smith, and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. We still have two more crops to explore. Corn is one of the biggest and most important of our row crops, and that's not just in size. This truly unique plant has a lot to offer. And wheat, one of the oldest cultivated grains in the world. But what exactly is wheat, and what makes it so special? We get into the dirt with these two important crops. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. In our second special report, we look at a common sight in ag country, corn. The tall, tasseled, enigmatic plant that's the official state vegetable of Illinois. Here in Mississippi, it's one of our biggest row crops, and if you drive through the Delta, you'll spot fields as far as the eye can see. But what makes corn such an important commodity? What makes this plant so important? Here's a deeper look. Corn. 
common sight in ag country. You can travel miles and see nothing but graceful stalks swaying in the breeze. In Mississippi, it's the fourth highest commodity with over 129 million bushels produced in 2021. Not only that, but nationwide, U.S. corn growers produced 15.1 billion bushels last year, according to the USDA. So, what makes this plant so unique? What exactly is corn? Corn is a, is a temperate plant that is grown in, in areas of significant rainfall, uh, but moderate conditions overall. It likes uh, mild temperatures, um, plentiful rainfall, but not abundant rainfall like you'd have in tropical regions. And it's, a, it's an annual grass plant, which means that we plant it in the spring. It has a relatively long growing season. It's about 120 days or about four months in length. It's planted early in the spring. It grows through the summer. And in Mississippi, it's harvested late in the summer. In areas, other, other regions of the United States, it would be in the fall. Like most row crops, corn has several growth stages experts refer to. VE through VT, measure the plant's growth from seedling to fully grown and tasseling. R1 through R6 are the reproductive stages that produce the corn on cobs we're familiar with. A, a corn plant is unique in that it has a separate male and female part on the plant. The tassel is a male part that sheds the pollen and the ear contains silks which receive the pollen and are basically the female organ on the plant. Corn is somewhat unique in that it cross-pollinates so the neighbor, neighboring plants actually provide the pollen in many cases to uh, pollinate the ears on, on the plants in the adjacent rows. So that's why you oftentimes need to plant more than one or two rows in your garden because you need some physical space in order to facilitate the movement of that pollen to the, to the ears on a separate plant in order for it to pollinate. There are many kinds of corn varieties, but the one most commonly grown in the U.S. is not what you'd find in the grocery store. Most of the corn that's grown in fields is what we call dent corn. It is developed because it, it produces a lot of starch, has a good feed value. Ears of corn that you would buy at the grocery store is gonna be sweet corn. The type of plant is the same, it's just bred for a different purpose and it, it, it has completely different characteristics as far as the kernels and the, the content of those kernels. It has less starch in the kernels and more sugar content, more water and it just tastes better, it's a lot more palatable to humans. Sweet corn is picked during the middle of the grown or during the middle of the reproductive stages before the kernels are completely mature. Corn that is um, harvested for, for normal use, you let the kernels completely mature and then actually dry down to a to a moisture that is suitable for long-term storage for use in bins and other facilities that hold grain. So the vast majority of corn grown in the U.S. is used as animal feed, but there are some other well-known uses for corn, such as ethanol or biodiesel, corn syrup, a common sweetener, and the starch itself, commonly used in cooking. But it's not just feed and industrial use that makes it popular. It also works well with other crops. Corn is used in Mississippi primarily as a crop that, that complements our other two primary row crops in Mississippi in a crop rotation system. So corn is used and is grown in a field one year and then we rotate that field the next year to cotton or soybeans generally. So that helps eliminate a lot of the uh, pest issues, whether it be weeds, diseases, or insect issues. It eliminates a lot of those or greatly reduces the likelihood of those being a significant problem. Plus it has a significant benefit to both of the crops involved in the rotation system, which enhances the productivity of, of those crops as well. So what are the major problems farmers face when growing corn? Corn is a little bit unique in that uh, it is much more sensitive to what we call stand issues or emergence issues. Not only do we have to deal with having restrictions to plant the crop, but corn is very intolerant or very sensitive to issues that, you know, where we lose a certain percentage of the, of the seedlings that don't successfully emerge or they're delayed and stunted during the, the planting process and, and uh, the management and environmental restrictions that occur shortly after seeding the crop. Corn is a valuable ag commodity, not only because of its versatility, but because with a little care and good weather, it can produce an abundance of grain. 
it's a productive crop too that, that produces a lot higher volume of grain than a lot of our other row crops that are grown. Not only is it a high quality source of feed, it, it produces a high volume as well. So that's corn, a major player in the ag markets, grown all over the world, valued for its high output and many different uses. In our final feature this week, a new special report on important commodities that affect our everyday lives. This one focusing on wheat. It's a crop that's been important for a long time, has quite a history, and used in many, many things. But what is it that makes wheat such a fascinating plant? Not to mention, what are the challenges of growing it? I looked a bit deeper to see exactly what is wheat. It's one of the most recognizable crops in the world, commonly seen as waves of golden color across vast open fields. Wheat, a staple food for thousands of years and used in many products. But what exactly is this special plant? What exactly is wheat? According to Encyclopedia Britannica, wheat is one of the oldest and most important of the cereal crops. Of the many varieties known, the most important are common wheat used to make bread, durum wheat, used in making pasta, and club wheat, a softer type, also used for baking flours. As a plant, wheat is a type of grass, just like corn, and like its cousin, it's cultivated to produce grains, also known as kernels, that are then eaten. However, unlike corn, the grain is mostly consumed by people, with only a small percentage going towards animal feed or other uses. There are six main types of wheat grown commercially across the world. Soft red winter, hard red winter, hard red spring, hard white, soft white, and durum. As the name implies, winter wheats are planted around October to January and are harvested around May to August, while spring wheat is planted around March and April and harvested around July to September. Like other plants, wheat has several growth stages agronomists use to identify its life cycle. Emergence, when the main stem rises from the seed. Tillering, when secondary stems form. Stem extension, when the plant begins to grow upwards. Booting and head development, when the grain heads form. Flowering and grain filling, when the wheat begins to pollinate. And ripening and maturation, when the grain becomes what we know as wheat kernels. The wheat plant contains both male and female reproductive parts, which means it's able to pollinate itself, however, it does much better in groups. Not to mention, having more than one plant means more grain to harvest. Winter wheat does something interesting in its growing seasons. During the coldest months, it goes into a type of dormancy. That is, it grows much more slowly to compensate for the harsh climate. But once spring approaches, it bounces back. Even more interesting is that winter wheat varieties require freezing temperatures to activate their reproductive cycle. In other words, without the freeze, they can't make grain. In the U.S., hard red and soft red winter wheat produce more bushels per year than their spring counterparts. Like most crops, there are challenges producers face, including weather, disease, and insects. The greatest challenges tend to happen when the plant is young and most at risk to insect predation and weeds hogging the soil's nutrients. The greatest ongoing threat, however, is the weather, as drought can greatly hurt the growing and grain production of the plant. On a global scale, wheat is about 20% of the world's daily protein. The largest exporters are Russia, the US, Canada, France, and Ukraine. The largest importers are typically Egypt, Indonesia, Turkey, and the Philippines. China also produces a large quantity of wheat per year. In America, wheat is measured in bushels. Globally, it's measured in tons. Roughly one bushel of wheat weighs about 60 pounds, contains about 1 million kernels and can produce about 42 pounds of white flour. Although foodstuffs are the main use of wheat, it has other uses as well. The straw and the chaff, which is the discarded husk surrounding the kernel, can be used to make bioplastics, paper, particle board, and industrial absorbance. The kernels can be used to create ethanol, a biofuel. The middling, a byproduct of flour milling, is used as animal feed. So, 
What are the greatest driving factors concerning wheat prices? Well, there's emerging markets due to population increases that makes the demand for wheat higher. There's the weather, which can determine the international supply. Subsidies, specifically for ethanol, which is made mostly from corn, affect the amount of wheat acres grown and therefore the supply. The value of the dollar and governmental actions, such as import duties and taxes, which affect the buying price. Overall, wheat is a fascinating plant with a long history of feeding the human race. We've cultivated it for thousands of years and use it every day for staple food products. It's been a valuable and dependable commodity and there's no sign of that slowing down anytime soon. Such an interesting crop. And quick fact, the Roman goddess Ceres, who was considered the protector of grains, gave them their common name today, cereals. That's just one of the many things about wheat and grains that make them so integral to our lives. Well, that's it for our special episode of Farm Week. We hope you enjoyed getting a deeper dive into what makes these row crops tick. Sometimes it's good to take a step back and remind ourselves just how amazing they truly are. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.